My name is uh, Dan Shea. I'm a Vietnam veteran with Veterans for Peace, the local chapter here of uh, Veterans for Peace Chapter 72. As a Vietnam veteran, uh, my personal story and experiences has led me to, to be a person who, who has come to the decision that I will no longer support our tax dollars going towards uh, killing other people's children. During that period of time in 2006, I went back to uh, uh, Vietnam on a uh, Agent Orange tour there. It was a conference that we were doing, and I'm a victim of Agent Orange. I uh, lost my child uh, uh, at the age of three due to complications. There was a gentleman there named Dave Klein, who was one of the founders of uh, Vietnam Veterans Against the War, and he was in this movie called Sir No Sir. Sir No Sir is the story of these Vietnam veterans and a whole underground of movements of coffee houses throughout the country, uh, underground papers and GIs resisting uh, uh, U.S. influences in other countries, and these veterans were speaking out. This became uh, part of what uh, became the first Winter Soldier and in fact, there's a book called Winter Soldier, The Oral History of the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And in that book, you know, I'm just reading, uh, the term Winter Soldier was created by VVAW members who first adopted the name in 1971. They had created the term by inverting Thomas Paine's well-known words about summer soldiers. Uh, the summer soldiers and the Sunshine Patriots will, in crisis, shrink from the service of their own country. Payne had been writing to encourage Americans, the ragtag army of citizen soldiers, to confront the most powerful military force in the world in order to protect their new one independence and their democratic ideals. And anti-war veterans saw the analogy with their own situation. And during the hearings to investigate possible war crimes committed by American troops and their allies, BBAW claimed that such abuses were not aberrations but were a part of the standard operating procedures in Vietnam. We all know about My Lai, but there are many, many My Lai's. Iraqi veterans against the war began to speak out. Their voices began to become something that I became familiar with, and that was the voices of the veterans of the Vietnam era. We were taught to kill on order, uh, to kill innocent people, women and children. Well, Nazis followed orders, and I think that this is where there's some sort of consciousness begins to happen to the veterans, and they begin to realize that they gotta take responsibility for those people that become victims of our guns and our bullets and our bombs, as well as the men and women uh, uh, that are serving with them. Why are they dying? You have to begin to ask that question. Well, Winter Soldier uh, became a part of something that, <clears throat> that the Iraqi veterans followed up after uh, uh, the Vietnam, Vietnam veterans. And it became something in which I think uh, has started happening where they had uh, uh, winter soldier hearings across the nation. Uh, we began to form a, a movement here in Portland uh, to cover all of Oregon for IVAW. That's where I met Benji Lewis uh, and when he came up to speak on winter soldier hearing that we held here in Portland. Uh, and this was the beginning of IVAW Oregon. Also. And you'll listen to some of these veterans who are still struggling with where they are at a particular time in history. And as they grow older and become more mature and more educated, uh, they begin to see that what their government told them was based on a lie. You'll hear them talk about rules of engagement. Many of the veterans talk about how those rules of engagement change uh, over a period of time. And those rules of engagement, as it changes, actually opened up the doors for more violations, uh, human rights violations, and war crimes to be committed. People are also put into situations, situations in which they had no choice uh, but to end up firing at innocent people. You'll hear about people who are just running convoys, and because those IEDs uh, improvise the explosives uh, along the roads, uh, they don't want to stop wherever they are at in a convoy and they have to keep going, they're under orders. So a woman or a child may be running out in front of uh, uh, the road, they go over and a speed bump begins to be innocent women and children as they're going by. How do you come back to your country and live with yourself knowing that these people weren't trying to attack you at that point in time and that you had to run over a, a, a mother and a child or at certain places in which they had checkpoints in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, and a car is coming towards them, and somebody's speaking in English, 
and saying stop and they can't hear it or their brakes don't work and they're running forward. And because of the fear that those people have, they began firing because they don't know if there's a bomb in that car or not. And because they weren't prepared to speak in the language of the people or because they were built up in certain kinds of fear, uh, they fired on innocent families and those people were killed. For me, post-traumatic stress is more than just the combat trauma that I experienced, but, the, but the, the, the very betrayal of why we went to war. The military, in its earnest effort to maintain bodies in Iraq and Afghanistan, are refusing those, those people's rights and consciousness to, to say they will no longer support this war.